Greetings! Welcome to Electronics 2, lecture number 28. I am Beza Razavi. Today we will continue to look at the general negative feedback system and discover some of its uh, interesting properties. In particular, uh, we will go over some examples just to get comfortable with the general idea of feedback. And uh, then we'll talk about an important concept, the concept of loop gain and see the role that it plays in the performance of the overall system. And follow, uh, finally, we will look at the properties of negative feedback systems. And this is where we begin to see why negative feedback systems are interesting and useful. Why it is that applying feedback can improve the performance of the circuit. Okay, but before we go there, let's just uh, look at what we covered last time we introduced the, the general negative feedback system as shown here on the left. We said that we start out with a, an amplifier or some other system that is poorly controlled. It's a wild, untamed system. Uh, the voltage gain may not be accurate or the speed of the car may not be accurate. And we decided to embed this uh, feed forward system in, a, in an overall feedback loop uh, consisting of that, a feedback network, and a subtractor. So we sense the output of the system. It could be the voltage of a, the output voltage of an amplifier, or it could be the speed of a car. We pass it through a network. We don't know what this network is for yet, but that's okay. And then we subtract the result from the input. So the input does not go here. The input goes here. And this uh, forms the overall negative feedback system. Now, <clears throat> we saw that in a negative feedback system, we need four components. The original feedforward system, which we are trying to correct and improve. A means of sensing this output, maybe just a wire. Uh, a feedback network, which we don't know still what it does. And a subtractor that subtracts uh, this feedback signal from the input signal. We also called uh, this output, meaning x minus u, the error signal. Okay, so then we came along and calculated the transfer function from the input to the output, and we saw that it is of this form, a1 divided by 1 plus ka1. a1 is the original gain that we had when we bought this amplifier. We call that the open loop gain. And the result, this whole thing, is now called the closed loop gain, because we have closed the loop around the amplifier. And because K and A1 are positive, assuming that there's a negative sign here, then we see that the closed loop gain is less than the open loop gain. So we are compromising some gain. We are losing some gain, but presumably there are some benefits that justify this gain reduction. Okay, we also found the error signal right here as X minus U, and it came out to be x divided by 1 plus ka1. So we saw that if uh, this number is large enough for the error to be small, then that means that x minus u is small, so x and u are very close to each other. So u, the feedback signal, is close to the input signal. And in fact, that's a golden rule that we will write out right here. So we say in a well-designed <clears throat> negative feedback system the feedback signal is a good copy, or we can call it a replica, of the input signal. So that's good to remember, uh, because many a time, knowing this helps us analyze a system much more easily. All right, so we we'll write that down. Okay. All right, so let's go over some examples of various uh, 
feedback uh, uh, circuits and so forth just to get comfortable. So let me start with an example here. <coughs> All right, in this example, I will uh, assume that I have a system like this. Uh, all right, so I will draw that system again. It's good to draw it every time so that it really sinks into our uh, mind. So X and Y, A1 and K. All right. And let's give it some numbers and see what happens. So I will assume that A1 is 100. So I bought an amplifier with a gain of 100, but it's poorly controlled. So this gain might be 100, might be less, maybe more. And then let's assume that K is 0.1. Okay, just as an example. All right. Okay, so we would like to find Y over X. That's easy, right? So y over x is a1 over 1 plus k a1. So 100 divided by 1 plus 10. So that is equal to 100 over 11, which is something like 9.09. All right, so far so good. Okay, so that wasn't particularly hard. Uh, all right, let's go and uh, look at another example. What happens if A1 drops to 50 in the previous example? So I bought this amplifier, and it had a nominal gain of 100. But uh, when I bought it uh, because of various uh, variabilities, or maybe because the temperature changed or something, gain, the gain dropped to 50. So A1 is 50. So now how much is the closed loop gain? OK, so y over x is equal to 50 over 1 plus 5. So that's 50 over 6, right? Okay, so 50 over 6 is like 8.33. So that's 8.33. So let's compare this change with that change. A1 dropped by a factor of 2, right? 100 to 50. The closed loop gain changed by a small amount. It changed from 9.09 .09 to 8.33, about 10%, right? So even though the, the open loop gain changed by, 100 per, by a factor of 2, the closed loop gain changed by about 10%. So let's write that here. Even though the open loop gain changed by a factor of 2 the closed loop gain changed by only 10%. So this is perhaps the most important result that comes from negative feedback. All right? The fact that changes in the open loop gain do not affect the closed loop gain that much. Right? A significant change in A1 leads to only a minor change in the closed loop gain, y over x, this whole fraction here. And that's the beauty of negative feedback. Okay, so we'll elaborate this on this more and more, but this is the net result that comes out. All right, so uh, let's uh, also uh, think of it as follows. 
Um, so I wanted to write that. So what we see is, uh, and let's make an observation here, which uh, readily puts this result in perspective. So if I go back here, and I make an observation that if Ka1, this uh, term, is much greater than 1, then what I can say is that this is negligible, this becomes 1 over k. So y over x is approximately equal to 1 over k. So if Ka1, which we will have a name for later, we will call it the loop gain, if Ka1 is much greater than 1, then the closed loop gain becomes independent of the open loop gain, right? So that means that the closed loop gain is relatively independent of the open loop gain, A1. And once we look at it from this perspective, this makes sense, right? Because it's relatively independent, if A1 changes, we see that A1 doesn't show up here, right? If A1 doesn't show up here, then obviously Y over X doesn't change, doesn't change much. So in our example here, Ka1 was 10, right? 0 0.1 times 100, it was 10. So it was relatively large, right? And because of that, we saw that the dependency of Y over X upon A1 was pretty weak. Even though A1 changed from 100 to 50, the gain changed, the closed loop gain changed by only 10%. But fundamentally, it's really because of this, right? And this tells us that to achieve this uh, independence, to achieve a closed loop gain that is not a strong function of A1, we would like to maximize this, right? So we should try to maximize Ka1. The larger Ka1, the much uh, the the larger the ratio of Ka1 and one, right? Uh, then the better this approximation. So the less uh, y over x will depend upon A1. All right, so that's the fundamental principle behind negative feedback systems, and it plays such a strong role, such a profound role in everything else that we will do from here on. All right, very good. So uh, that is one of the key points that comes out here. Um, also, uh, what we observe is that uh, So let's make one more observation. We see that the closed loop gain came out to be 1 over k. Okay. Now, I hope that the closed loop gain is still greater than 1, right? I'm trying to build an amplifier with a gain of maybe a 9 or 8 or something. So that means that k itself has to be less than 1. So k is usually chosen chosen equal to or less than 1, right? If k is greater than 1, then the closed loop gain will be less than 1, and that's not a very useful circuit, right? So you built this whole system, but the gain from 2 here is less than 1. What does it do? It doesn't do much. So in most cases, we prefer to have a gain of 1 or higher, which means k is at most 1, usually less than 1. All right, so remember that too. These are both very useful properties and uh, points to remember. Okay, so I would like to go over another example of feedback circuits. This time we're trying to go a little deeper into towards circuit level, right? These have not really touched the circuit level, so I would like to do that 
Let me go to the next page because I need more maneuvering room. And let's do this. <clears throat> okay, so here's another example. I have uh, this general system. Again, I just draw it so that I have it here. X, Y, A1, K, positive, negative. All right? Okay. So, I'm hoping to build some sort of circuit level implementation for this system, right? Uh, we have various circuit components. We've learned from electronics one, electronics two. So can we build that? All right, well, uh, let's just make an observation first. Uh, look at this little box here. This red box. This red box receives two inputs and generates one output, right? How much is that output? So we see that at this point, the red box generates x minus u times a1. Is that okay? So these two go into here, we subtract, we multiply by a1, we generate right here. So that's what this red box is doing. Do I know of any familiar circuits from electronics one that does this? It takes two inputs, subtracts them, multiplies the result by some gain. Yes, that's an op amp, right? So if you have an op amp, so plus minus V in one, V in two, gain of A1, indeed out here we get V in one minus V in two times A1. So that circuitry inside that uh, uh, red box is actually an op amp, right? You can implement it as an op amp. So let's go, go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. All right, so here we go. Uh, I have an op amp with a gain of A1 plus and minus. So one input is X, the other one input is U. So X goes here and U goes here. Right, so we decided that this is the same as this. Very good. Okay, how about this K? All right, so K is a feedback network. What does it do? Remember that we decided that K should be less than one? So K should be less than one. So I have a voltage produced by this amplifier, this op amp, and I need to attenuate that voltage before I get to U, because K is less than one. This voltage should be less than this voltage. I have to attenuate. How do you attenuate the voltage? We know how to do that, right? The voltage uh, divider. So we take a voltage divider like this, and we give it here. This time I'm traveling this way, so I hope it's clear that this is a voltage divider, right? So if the voltage goes in here, we have two resistors, R1 and R2, and we're coming out this way. So we know that this system, this circuit divides the voltage. So, in fact, what we know is that U is equal to this resistor divided by this plus this times this voltage. So R2 over R1 plus R2 times Y. So this is the negative feedback circuit. It has all the components that we were looking for, right? Uh, we have a basic amplifier that we bought and uh, it's wild, it's untamed, because, for example, when you buy an op amp, it, it is true that the gain is specified to be, let's say, 10,000, but that gain can vary by maybe plus minus 20%, 30%, so it's not a precise gain. Okay, we have a feedback network. The feedback network is just this. Now you can see why the feedback network is necessary. I needed to divide the output by some factor. So I use this feedback network to do that. So this whole thing is the feedback network, right? And then I need a subtractor. Well, it turned out that the subtractor and the amplifier can be merged into one, just an op amp. The op amp can perform both the subtraction and the amplification. 
So the up amp does both. So we have everything. We are sensing the output voltage by means of this resistive divider as well, right? Sensing just connecting to the output voltage. Now, of course, if you uh, think about this a little carefully, you see that this is in fact what we called a non-inverting amplifier in electronics one, right? So this is in fact that non-inverting amplifier and we analyze the circuit in electronics one uh, without knowing anything about feedback, right? We just uh, treat it as a simple circuit. Uh, maybe we assumed A1 is much greater than 1, and then we found that the voltage gain was approximately 1 plus R1 over R2. But here, we arrived at the circuit from this perspective. We said, I want to implement this. I thought about it, and I mapped it into the circuit. Okay, very good. So we have this little circuit here. Uh, that's indeed a negative feedback circuit. <clears throat> All right, so uh, let's try to find the closed loop voltage gain just the way we did here. So how much is that? So y over x is equal to, um, we remember that uh, it should be a1 over 1 plus k a1, right? That's the general equation for this system. A1 is still the gain of the op amp, so that still goes there. 1 plus K. K is the feedback factor. K is U divided by Y, right? How much signal we have here divided by this signal. And because this is an attenuator, K is this much, right? So K is R2 over one, R1 plus R2 times A1. And in fact, this is that something that we might have derived in electronics one with just basic KVL and KCL without knowing anything about feedback. All right, so this is the closed loop gain of the circuit, right? Okay, now what did we say about a well-designed negative feedback circuit? So we say in a well-designed negative feedback circuit uh, we want KA1 to be much greater than 1, right? We want this to be much greater than 1 so that this is negligible A1 cancels out, we end up with 1 over K so we, the closed loop gain is not a strong function of the open loop gain. So we should do the same thing here. So that means that we want this R2 over R1 plus R2 times A1 to be much greater than 1. For example, let's say the op amp has a gain of 1000, A1 is 1000, and this is 10, so the, this is 1 over 10, so the product would be 100, which is quite higher than 1. <clears throat> okay, now if that holds, then we can say that y over x is approximately equal to, uh, this drops out, this drops out, 1 over k. And because k is this, 1 over k is 1 plus r1 over r2. Again, a familiar result from electronics one. All right, so that's the overall picture that we have here. Uh, let's see if there's anything else that we can uh, discover. All right, now I have advertised negative feedback as a means of defining and controlling the gain of an amplifier. So I said, yes, the gain of this op amp may vary all over the place, but now that we have a, a negative feedback system around it, the gain is now this. It's not a very strong function of A1, right? It has very little to do with A1. Now you may ask, well, but you have these resistors. So then what happens if the resistors change with temperature, right? 
can this result still be a relatively accurate and well-defined number? And the answer is yes. So let's talk about that. Okay, so even if R1 and R2 vary with temperature or other factors, right? So you say etc. One plus R1 over R2 is accurate. Okay, why? Well, uh, the point is that I can make R1 and R2 of the same material, in fact of the same shape, so that even though each of them changes by some amount, the ratio R1 over R2 does not. It remains constant. So let me show you exactly how this is done, especially in integrated circuits. So we want to build these resistors on a chip, and we want to make sure that R1 over R2 is relatively accurate and not dependent on temperature or variation from one chip to another chip. All right, so give you, let's give, look at an example. Let's suppose that I'm looking for um, R y over x equals 5. Well, 5 is a strange number. Usually it would be 4. So let's pick that to be 4. Okay, I want to be a precise 4. Right, like 4.0 maybe. Okay. So the way I would do that is that, okay, so y over x has to be 4, which means r1 over r2 has to be 3. So r1 over r2 must be 3. All right. Okay. So I will do this. If you look at the resistor from top on a chip, it looks like this. It's a big rectangle with two contacts, one contact here, one contact here, right? So the wires come and contact the resistor on these two sides. That's a resistor. So I built one resistor, one unit, equal to R2. This is R2. Now, R1 has to be three times R2, right? So I'm going to take three of these units right next to this and connect them in series. So here are three units exactly copied from here and those are placed in series. So as you can see like that, so this is one wire, these are in series, these are in series and these are connected because you can see that R1 and R2 join here, right? So they, they are joined right here. So this part will form R1 for us. So now you can see that R1 is equal to three unit resistors and R2 is one unit resistor. So regardless of how this unit resistance is changing with temperature, R1 or R2 is always three, right? Because RU is the same. This unit and this unit always go up and down in temperature together. So the ratio is always three. And that's the beauty of uh, this type of idea. Okay, so that's how we can build very precise gains uh, even though the op amp is not well controlled, even though the resistors themselves may not be very well controlled. This is just because we are relying on the ratio of two resistors. Very well. <clears throat> Let's uh, move on to the concept of the loop gain now. So loop gain. <clears throat> All right. Well, uh, we have seen this by now, but uh, now we will give it officially a name. You see this uh, value here, which I said has to be much greater than 1? So that is what we call the loop gain. So loop gain is called k times a1. That's called the loop gain. In other words, in a well-designed feedback system, we would like the loop gain to be relatively high compared to 1, right? Much greater than 1. So we say in a well 
designed negative feedback system <coughs> the loop gain is much greater than one right now how much greater is a factor of 10 good is it factor should it be factor 100 etc those are details that depend on the application but generally we just uh, accept that the loop gain has to be much greater than one so that the closed loop gain becomes relatively independent of the open loop gain right that's the objective all right so that is uh, what we mean by the loop gain now <clears throat> um, so in other words uh, the loop gain and that means that the closed loop gain becomes approximately equal to 1 over k, right, as we saw before. And it's important to make sure we do not confuse the loop gain with the closed loop gain. These are two different things, right? The loop gain is ka1, the closed loop gain is a1 over 1 plus ka1. All right, so as an example, uh, let's go and find the loop gain of the circuit. So find the loop gain in the uh, non-inverting amplifier. Okay, that's easy, right? K times A1. So K times A1. And that is equal to K is given by the resistors. So that's R2 over R1 plus R2 times A1. All right. Okay, so that is the loop gain. Now, why do we call this the loop gain? Anyway, where does it come from? In fact, we will, we will see why it is called the loop gain, and we will develop a methodology for finding the loop gain in a circuit. In this circuit, it was easy to find the loop gain. But if I give you some really complex loop with lots of stuff in it, and say find the loop gain, how do you exactly go about calculating it, right? Where do you look in the circuit? What do you multiply by what to become the loop gain, right? So we need a methodology for that. So we'll look at uh, a loop gain calculation. All right, so the uh, idea is simple. We take our negative feedback system that we have developed so far, And we perform two operations. Okay. First operation is we set the input to zero. All right. The second operation is we, we, we break the loop somewhere. We break the loop. Where? Anywhere you want, really. So let me actually break the loop here. So by breaking the loop, we mean we stop the feedback signal from traveling, right? So, K okay, here. I just break it right here. Right? This wire was coming down. I just broke it right here. All right. And then we apply a test signal here, test voltage. Call it the V test. We follow the signal through the loop. So this V test goes through this, goes through this, goes through this, and comes back. Comes back to exactly where we broke the loop. So wherever it comes back, we call that VF. You can call it feedback signal if you want. And the loop gain is computed as, so the loop gain is computed as, 
Uh, the feedback signal that we got here, Vf, divided by what we applied, the test signal, V test, but with a negative sign. Okay, that's the computation of the loop. This is the procedure for finding a loop. Gain. Now let's quickly check and see if this actually gives us this value here, Ka1, right? Because that was what we called the loop gain. So does this procedure give us Ka1? We will see. All right, so V test goes, gets multiplied by K, then by minus 1. And then this is 0, so it just goes to the output, right? And gets multiplied by A1 and becomes Vf. So indeed, Vf over V test with a negative sign gives us Ka1. So indeed, this is Ka1. Okay, so now we see why we call the loop K. It means that if you travel around the loop, the gain that we will see is that much, right? As I travel, as I go and walk around the loop and come back to the same point, the gain that I see is some gain here, some gain here, some gain here, etc. until I get here, that's the loop gain. There's a negative sign involved that we have to be careful about, but otherwise, that's the loop gain. All right, so that's why we call it the loop gain. Okay, so uh, the key point here is that the loop gain plays a critical role in the performance of the overall system. If the loop gain is large enough, then the closed loop gain is relatively independent of the open loop gain. And it's just given by 1 over k. And we saw that 1 over k can be a pretty accurate number because it's just the, can be the ratio of two quantities, two like quantities. All right, so that is the loop gain. Okay, uh, let me give you an example. Now, uh, in finding the loop gain, I said that first set the input to zero, then break the loop. And I broke the loop here. Can I break it somewhere else? Yes, in principle, we can break the loop anywhere we want. So here's a, another case. <clears throat> so at this time, I break it, break it right here. I apply V test. I set the input to zero, zero, and I go around the loop, and I would like to find what I get for Vf and see what the loop gain is. So it's a quiz. I'll give you one minute to think about it. All right, so did you get the same result as what we got before? Okay, well, we just follow the signal, right? So we have V test <coughs> multiplied by minus 1, then multiplied by A1, then multiplied by K. That gives us Vf. So indeed, Vf over V test with a negative sign gives us Ka1. So that's true. Okay, well, let's go over another example. Remember the circuit? We're going to go to the... Next slide, and look at another example here. Okay, I uh, need to go to the next slide. Okay, all right. So, 
So here's uh, our inverting amplifier. This time I will draw the resistors like this, right? It's the same thing, R1 and R2. And I will break the loop right here. So I apply my test signal over here. I set the input to zero. And uh, I travel around the loop and I find what comes back. Okay, so what do we get? So V test times A1 but with a negative sign. So times minus A1 times this ratio, this uh, division ratio, so R2 over R1 plus R2 is equal to Vf. So again, the loop gain. So Vf over V test minus is equal to R2 over R1 plus R2 times A1, as we computed before. All right, so it all checks out. OK, now I keep writing this and calling it loop gain. Uh, some books use a notation for the loop gain, right? What do we call it? What, do we use some sort of letter or symbol for the loop gain? In fact, some books call the loop gain T. But you can imagine all sorts of problems, right? Because T also stands for temperature, and some cases even time. So that causes lots of confusion. So I will just call it loop gain. I will not try to use a letter for the loop gain, OK? Sometimes we may call it LG, loop gain, but we just call it loop gain. All right, so that is the loop gain of that circuit. Here's one more example. I have this circuit, and I want to analyze it from uh, the feedback knowledge that I have developed so far. Okay, so what does this, how does this map into a general feedback system? Well, the only thing that has happened is that K is 1, right? We did not attenuate the output to go back to the input. We just fed all of the output to the input. So K is 1. So I can say y, equals, y over x is a1 over 1 plus k a1. And that's just a1 over 1 plus a1, right? Because k is 1. Now if a1 is much greater than 1, so it, that would be approximately equal to 1, right? So this is, of course, what we call the unity gain buffer in electronics 1. Right, unity gain, meaning that the gain, the closed loop gain, is approximately equal to 1, as we just saw. So this is the extreme case for k. As I said, k is usually less than 1. It is 1. If it is 1, then we have a, a closed loop gain of 1. Right, closed loop gain is 1, and the open loop gain is a1, some, something, maybe, maybe 10, maybe 100, maybe 1,000. Uh, so unity gain buffers are used sometimes in electronic design, and this is an example of how they map to a negative feedback system. So you see that in this case, the loop gain, which is equal to k times a1, is just a1, right? Because k is 1. Okay, so that's another example of a negative feedback circuit. All right, so uh, we need to talk about the properties of uh, negative feedback systems. And uh, the most important property is really uh, what we have seen before. So one important property So this is nothing new, really. We've seen this uh, throughout this lecture. If the loop gain, Ka1, is much greater than 1, 
then the closed loop gain, y over x, is approximately equal to 1 over k, and relatively independent of a1, the closed loop gain, the open loop gain, right? So the closed loop gain is relatively independent of the open loop gain. All right, so this poorly controlled amplifier still gives us a pretty good performance for the overall negative feedback system because for the overall negative feedback system, the closed loop gain is this much. All right, so this means that any parameter that affects A1 affects this one less.